mm-hmm. but there's a comma which floats around in there. Yeah. It keeps changing position. So it becomes circular comma, causal and feedback mechanisms. Circular causal comma and feedback mechanisms. Circular comma, causal and feedback comma mechanisms. So there are all sorts of little variations that went on just by shifting the comma. Hmm. I thought Reynolds was going to ask whether it was only a matter of convenience to use the word cybernetics and Heinz's preference for convenience, or and the fact that it really did reflect, that word in its generality did reflect the broader interests of the Macy meetings, and therefore the word and the longer title were rather similar. I don't think so. One has to remember he was a newbie. He showed up, that was the first time he had shown up. Wiener was not a dominant figure in the conferences at all. It was Rosenbluth rather than Wiener who had sparked the whole thing and was more strongly associated with with the circular causality and teleological mechanisms and so forth. And interestingly enough, the conference where Heinz made this suggestion, the sixth conference, causing according to legend, Wiener to leave the room, he was so touched to hide his tears, that would be the last time Wiener would attend any Macy conferences. Interesting. All of the history about how it happened then, notwithstanding, Heinz would later tell the story to reflect the idea that it was his perception of the correspondence of the ideas that led him to cause the name to be changed. Mm -hmm. And and he felt it. He told me he felt it was in the air. He felt he said that his execrable English was so poor that he couldn't cope with the long title. But he also felt that cybernetics was in the air. But when he met, when he suggested it, Vina burst into tears, and everyone else applauded. So, mm. I, I just I think we're all busy saying that there was a feeling that these things came together. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I I personally would probably agree with. You that it wasn't Heinz's brightest ever idea. <laughs> so anyway, that's how we got stuck with the title. By the time the conferences had run their course, had they generated the sort of transdiscipline that Fremont Smith had aspired to when he set them up and sponsored them? The short answer, no. What did they accomplish? Well, McCulloch, who at the end was required to write a report summarizing the ten conferences, basically said we've learned to know one another a bit better and to fight fair in our shirt sleeves. That is his official stance on the progress they made. As we've mentioned, Wiener got immortalized, Heinz got energized, and would surface again to continue the threads that had started. Now, to go back to the Macy conferences, I still recommend Heinz's book, as the best single reference on the crazy history of how it coalesced and what they did. But what concerns us is what happened after that. Okay, they got together, they said, this is cool. They said, uh, we call, we'll call it cybernetics. We'll name it after this guy's book. What happened next? Three things screwed up cybernetics. The first was the devil Herman, Herbert Simon. Um, <clears throat> Now, by the mid-50s, some of the things that had been associated with the people involved in the Macy conferences, like computers, like communication, so on and so forth, had gone in a different direction. The Dartmouth Conference in 1956 established what we would call AI, cognitivism, representationalism, not only in terms of computer models, but also in terms of an approach to studying cognition itself, to mentation itself, and over in management in terms of how decision processes were going to be characterized, modeled, and leveraged. What they essentially threw out was everything about circularity. They managed by the 60s with relatively underhanded practices to wipe out interest in analog and neural models as far as engineering and computing kinds of things. And they essentially wiped out interest in similarities that cut across both biological and technical systems. 
The second thing that went wrong or tainted cybernetics was people drawing an equivalence between cybernetics and strict association with robots automation. And particularly those of us old enough to remember the 50s, that was the decade when alienation and apprehension with regard to these kinds of industrial things started to surface. And if cybernetics was the term being applied to this, cybernetics got part of the blame, splattered upon it. Finally, and on a lighter note, the other thing that sort of tainted cybernetics were some wild applications of the word itself. <laughs> it's been used for a lot of things. It's been associated with a lot of things. The field itself was named for a book. So it's entirely consistent for me to try to trace the downfall of the notion of cybernetics, at least in the popular imagination, in terms of book titles. First off, you expect a certain amount of free play in fiction and poetry. So it wasn't that big a deal that science fiction authors in particular played fast and loose with the notion of cybernetics, such as the cybernetic walrus from Jack Chalker, which literally was about a cybernetic or robotic walrus, but which also reinforced the notion that cybernetic has something to do with mechanization or robotics. One strange one is the cybernetic possum, which uh, is actually recent. It's less than five years old. A uh, poetic work written by a taxi driver about the notion of adopting a possum he had inadvertently run over. In this case, he mentions that what makes the possum cybernetic is apparently the addition of wheels in case his hind legs were crushed. Well, anyway. Maxwell Maltz, plastic surgeon, made a mint in the 60s writing Psycho-Cybernetics, which is basically power of positive thinking with reference to feedback loops. Nothing particularly bad about that, except that it set off an entire genre of this cybernetics, that cybernetics, so on and so forth, in self-help, personal motivation, and so on. Hypno-Cybernetics success cybernetics, cybernetics within us. They were even importing cybernetics texts, translating them into English, and churning them out at quite a quick rate. Most advertising that your life will be better, mental programming, you'll be more efficient, you will be happier. You will be happier. You will be happier. Over in the business field, the same kind of thing was going on, at least with regard to sales cybernetics. Once again, we'll make you successful. You'll psych yourself into better sales. Meanwhile, by making allusions to computer support, or in the particular case of this one, digital signal processing models, the label got applied to dealing with stocks, bonds, and so on and so forth. So not just, not just sales, but also your investments could be improved with this magic stuff called cybernetics. And then things just kept running away. These are actual images. I made these slides to prove it because you wouldn't believe me if I didn't. Well, cybernetics was not just for the nerds, geeks, and academics anymore. They actually had cybernetics for jocks. The earliest one I could find was taking it to the limit, basketball cybernetics. Again, playing on this mind programming or self-development in the context of competitive sports take immediate charge of your volleyball destiny with volleyball <laughs> cybernetics. In a curious way, the, the middle one is a bit more justifiable. It's actually an anthropological study of Kenyan long distance runners. And the allusion to cybernetics refers to the author's use of a systemic model. What was it? He phrased it as ethnosystem as the context for his analysis of the phenomenon of long distance running and its importance in Kenyan culture. 